welcome back to Bumblebee, where today we are talking about the top 10 legendary leaders who won famous battles, starting with Hannibal Barbanable. I will either find a way or make one. Sounds like your mom when she's mad about something, doesn't it? It was first said by Hannibal Barca, the guy that led the Carcinian army and has been named the father of strategy. Since even the Roman armies who feared him incorporated elements of Hannibal's tactics into their own strategic arsenal. His use of chemistry, transportation inventions, war animals, strategic use of environmental factors, and battlefield tactics render him a military genius. His logistics and strategy allowed his armies to fight against forces much larger and better equipped than him. He held out and repelled all efforts to drive him out of Italy for half a generation. One of the greatest military feats was the crossing of the Alps with his army, which bypassed the Roman garrisons and naval strength. His army was around 100,000 strong, which consisted of cavalry, siege engines, and famously 37 war elephants. After crossing the Alps, his army had lost about 25% of its strength, and some even put the loss at around 50%. This became one of the most celebrated achievements of ancient warfare, and was followed by an epic pillage of Rome. For the rest of their history, the phrase Hannibal is at the gates was used by Roman senators whenever disaster struck, and was also used by parents to scare their children at night. Pee wee? Nah, it's just Herman. And it really was, because Herman Balk defeated an entire Soviet army where he was outnumbered 7 to 1 in tanks, 11 to 1 in infantry infantry, and 20 to 1 in artillery. He started the war as a staff officer and ended at the German equivalent of a three-star general. He was also one of the only 27 soldiers to earn the Knight's Cross with oak leaves, swords, and diamonds, equivalent to three major honors in the US military. Sent to help retake Stalingrad, Balk found his entire division defended a 37-mile front with only one howitzer. He quickly maneuvered his units into a hammer, and as the Soviets prepared for their next attack, he let the heavy weaponry of his hammer fly, decimating 53 tanks and wiping out one Soviet tank corpse. For eight days straight, Balk held off Soviet firepower and pushed back. After six days of attrition, deception, and tactically astute defending, the entire Soviet 5th tank army had been wiped out. This defense earned his division the code name of Hannibal after the great tactician. During the period from December 7th, 1942 until January 31st, 1943, the Hannibals were credited with their destroying of 225 Five tanks, 347 anti-tank weapons, 35 artillery pieces, and killing 30,700 Soviet soldiers. Balk's division losses for the same period were only 16 tanks, 12 anti-tank weapons, 1,017 injured, and only 215 killed. Now for the man who leaves nothing but rags, a legacy of conquers, and four swords. Give my message to all the cowards of the world that if there is death on the battlefield, then Abu Suleiman was not dying like an old camel. Those were the dying words of Abu Suleiman, another name for Khalid bin Walid, the Arabian commander born in 1952 Mecca. He conquered Iraq, Iran, Armenia, Jordan, Syria, Palestine, and a lot of lands in the Arabia, roughly fighting 100 plus battles and aiding and defeating the Persian and Roman empires as well. His army was always less in quality and quantity, but he never lost. His first battle as a Muslim after his conversion in 627 AD was the Battle of Musa. He watched three commanders consecutively become martyred. So using his powerful attack plan and taking charge, Khalid's success withdrew the remaining troop of 3,000 while 200,000 soldiers were attacking them. The story goes that Khalid broke nine swords in that battle, and when he returned to the homeland with his men, citizens started throwing stones at them and shouting that they had left the battle like cowards. But the Prophet of Islam raised his hands and said that no one should dare talk bad about Khalid, as he is the one sword from the swords of Allah. Naturally, the first Khalifa appoints him a commander, but Khalid is later dismissed from his post on a sumptuary charge for giving an everyday poet 10,000 dinars from his own pocket. In 642 AD, when he died, he left behind four swords, ragged clothes, and a horse he fought battle on. Time shall never forget the man who conquered 70% of the land for the Muslims that reside there today. He will win who knows when to fight and when not to fight. That's right, baby, it's Art of War up next. Sun Tzu was a Chinese military strategist and general best known as the author of the work The Art of War, a treatise on the military strategy also known as the 13 chapters. The tactician lived, fought, and composed his work during the spring and autumn period preceding the warring states of 481 to 220 
51 BCE. Good time to drop a book on war, I guess. When the King Ho Lu of Wu was duking it out in the Wu Chu Wars of 512 to 506 BC, Ho Lu wanted to test Sun Tzu's skill and commitment before appointing him to lead as a general. Because writing the literal book on war, I guess, wasn't enough. So he commanded Sun to train his 180 concubines to be soldiers. Sun Tzu divided the harem in two, and the king's favorites were made their commanders. His first order is simple, just to turn right. The women laughed, not taking the exercise seriously, so he repeated himself, and again they laughed. So he had the two commanders beheaded and replaced. After that, the women obeyed his commands without hesitation, and the king hired him. The Boju victory is owed very much to this exact tactic of disciplining troops. The Chu forces were numerically superior to the Wu, and the king Ho Lu wanted to put off advancing on the field. General Fugai chose to act of his own accordance with Sun Tzu's strategic advice and gave the order to advance anyway. If the troops had hesitated and waited on orders of the king instead, they couldn't have driven the enemy from the field and captured the Chu capital of Ying. Meanwhile, in India, the Rajasthan Wranglers are in full force. The third Mughal emperor, Akbar, consolidated his empire across India throughout a series of striking military victories, creating one of the most affluent empires of the age. From age 16, Bairam played a active role in the early Mughal conquests of India and established the Mughal Empire under Humayun. He was consigned with the position of Keeper of the Seals and he also took part in military campaigns in Benaras, Bengal, and Gujarat. After the death of Humayun in 1556, he was designated regent over the young monarch Akbar in the midst of the war against Sikandar Shah. Then, in November, he led the Mughal force at the Second Battle of Panipat fought between Akbar and Hamu. Upon reaching the age of 19 in 1560, Emperor Akbar finally gained sole power over the empire and told Byram it's time to retire. His rise to the throne was very theatrical. He threw Byram's replacement out of a window, which does thoroughly indicate to people to not F with him. In the years 1568 to 73, all of the Rajasthan and almost all of what we know now as Punjab, Pakistan, and Central India, all the way to Bengal, had been conquered by the Mughals consecutively by Akbar's brain and Byram's sword. The formidable warlord, nicknamed the Scourge of God, is next. Who was the most powerful warlord in the ancient world? Well, if we're talking Eurasia, it's definitely Attila, king of the nomadic horseman warrior tribe, the Huns. This man truly enjoyed carnage and warfare, earning the nickname and fearsome reputation of Flagellum Dei, aka Scourge of God. Attila took the lead in 434 when his uncle died. He and his brother invaded and conquered the Balkans in 441, and by 443 they had pillaged their way to Constantinople. The Romans paid the Huns almost two tons of gold just to stop them pillaging, and they agreed to pay an annual tribute of about 1,500 pounds of gold to make them stay away. In 1445, Attila killed his brother Bleda. Apparently, Bleda wanted to kill him. The fact that he didn't invade the Roman Empire until 451, despite the hefty annual payment, was due to his personal friendship with Attias. In 450, however, the sister of the Western Roman Emperor Valentinian III sent her engagement ring to Attila the Hun and asked him to save her from a forced marriage. Attila didn't really need another wife, since he had plenty of them, but who was he to turn down a wedding? proposal from a pretty lady. He heads over there to take her by force from them. This was one of the very few times Attila did not have a successful invasion. His friend Ateus actually luckily had the Roman Ostrogoths to help him drive Attila out, who then went to Italy in 452 to harass some popes instead. But just like Alexander the Great, Attila has a super odd death and in 453 he dies in a drunken slumber suffocating on the blood of his own nosebleed. The next four on our list, including this mighty admiral, apparently all had a 0% defeat rate or money back guarantee. In the case of Admiral Yi Sun Shin of the Korean Navy, you're never getting your money back. He was never once defeated his whole career. To just get a sense of how brilliant Yi was, let's look at the strategy that won the Battle of Myeongyang. Considered the most remarkable battle out of the 26 he participated in and won. Before the battle, Yi's fleet of 130 was broken down to a measly 50 ships. Japanese adversaries approached with 130 ships, and Yi's obviously outnumbered like 10 to 1. Recognizing the importance of battlefield, Yi looked through various maps of Korea and found a narrow channel that's water flow change direction every three hours. He lured the Japanese back to the mouth of this channel where they can see his puny forces and decide to charge. Yi's flagship charged straight back at them at battle speed, cannons firing alone and going against the violent water flow that was carrying the Japanese ships right up to Yi's to be crushed underneath like paper. As he had timed, the water flow direction then flipped, causing the Japanese ships to crash into each other. The straits too narrow for them to recover and Yi took the chance to also bombard them with cannonballs. In the end, Yi's tiny fleet had 
destroyed 31 ships and lost none. But it's not just the battles he won that proved his brilliance. He's also the first person to make a modified version of the famous hammer and anvil tactic to a naval battle. Keep in mind when I say first, it's because he'd never heard of Hannibal or the Greeks using it. So in this point of view, yeah, he thought he was the original creator. The anthem of this next legendary leader is definitely, I want it, I got it. Whatever Bajireo set his eyes on, he won. And whoever got in his way was blown to smithereens. According to the British Army officer Bernard Montgomery, Bajireo was possibly the finest cavalry general ever produced in India. Bajireo's military course spanned 20 years, during which he fought 35 enemies. Yet he never witnessed a defeat and always came home victorious. Chronologically, the battles of Malwa in 1723, Dar in 24, Aurangabad in 24 as well, the Battle of Palkhead in 28, and Fielzobad in 37 were some of the most important Peshwa Bajro won and altered the course of history. He understood the importance of speed for operating in relatively plain terrains of northern India and adapted Mothra forces accordingly, and their weapons. No heavy artillery, not even cooks or supplies. Everyone would be given fixed cash to buy grains from local farmers, and they would eat the grain raw while riding the horse. After defeating Nizram in the Battle of Palkhead in 1728, Bajreo turned his attention to Malwa. In October 1728, he consigned a huge army commanded by his younger brother, Chimnaji Appa, and aided by the generals Shindi, Holkar, and Palwar. By the 29th of November, 1728, Chimnani's army defeated the Mughals. Bajreo would continue on to the Balkan Hand and the Gujarat campaigns, making way for the march to Delhi, and after that, evicting the exploitive Portuguese. Get ready for a hell of a rap sheet, because losing ain't an option for Alexander Savarov. Just to compare, Alexander the Great won four out of his four major battles. Julius Caesar won seven of eight, and Napoleon lost only five of 74. Alexander fought in 63 major battles and won 63 major battles. His military career spanned six decades, including the Seven Year War and the Russo-Turkish Wars and a series of rebellions against the Russian monarchy. He served the Russian Empire under four different rulers. With his immense knowledge of tactics, equipment, strategy, and siege warfare, he was as renowned a military man, not just in Russia, but all across Europe. In 1799, the French were occupying all of Italy, and the Austrians had lost their territory in northern Italy and called upon the Russians for assistance. Alexander waged a systematic campaign besieging cities, cutting off French garrisons, and defeating French armies. Several of the French Republic's best generals fall to him in that battle. Within just a couple months, the French were completely driven from Italy. Sofrov was prepared to march on Paris after this, but he was told to take his Russian troops into Switzerland and link up with a different Russian army, who sadly were defeated before he ever even arrived. The result that was he was surrounded by a French army of 80,000 instead. The worst part was is he only had 20,000 men at his disposal. Any other general would have been doomed, not him. He expertly determined determined features of the Swiss landscape and maneuvered around the French troops, fighting off limited attacks, staying elusive, and eventually slipping through the mountains and back to the friendly territory. For this, Alexander was given the title of General Misio of Russia, the greatest Russian military man of his era. And he died a few months later. The right hand man. Who is he? I hear about 99% of you saying right now. We've seen all the cons, but we've yet to see Subutai. The right hand man of Genghis Khan conquered more territory alone than any other leader on this list and in history itself. Genghis Khan himself had a few failed campaigns. Rommel, with all his talent and brains, was routed out of North Africa, and Alexander the G could not achieve his ultimate dream of conquering India. Bear in mind, homeboy Subutai didn't even rule a country. He was involved in 200 battles and around 180 were commanded by him, and he won every single one. He conquered 32 nations as the general of the army. Some of these include Russia, China, and most of Persia. Seriously, he conquered Russia and China, the former bane of Napoleon, never to be conquered again. And guess what? He fought all these battles in the winter. He crossed ice lakes and used them for roads. He's also remembered for devising a campaign that destroyed the armies of Hungary and Poland within two days of each other by forces 500 kilometers apart. He did a lot of his conquering at the age of 60 plus while having four princes as the generals of his armies. One desperately wanted him dead too. And then in 1241, as he was planning to invade the Holy Roman Empire, creating an empire so large it would have spanned over two continents. Sadly, he passed away, ending his military career. Honestly, if he hadn't died, I'm positive Subtuai would have conquered all of Europe. Even without these achievements, he still goes down as the greatest military leader of all time. All right, all right, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Be sure to like and subscribe if you wanna see more from us. Be sure to stay around.